right, hopefully uh, my presentation is going to stitch together, in fact I'm sure it will stitch together, some of the things that Hagley mentioned and some of the discussions that we had this morning on the technologies. Great. Uh, the structure of the presentation is, is a definition of an alternative or similar definition uh, of sustainability. Then we'll look at the development process in creating sustainable buildings. And then at the end, we'll just briefly touch on, on how that development process fits within the normal construction development life cycle. So what is sustainability? Fairly high level description, meeting the economic, environmental and social needs of today without compromising those of the future. Uh, quite an easy definition to sort of get a hold of, but very, very high level. Uh, and what I like to do is to try and break that down so we have a better understanding of what it means in each of the categories. Um, as Hagley mentioned, the social and the economic issues are, are dominant when you're looking at different sites. Uh, invariably, when we get involved, our clients have decided the type of building that they want uh, and the location for that building. And what you tend to find is by that stage, the good 80% uh, of the social and the economic issues have, have been addressed because we've decided what the function is, where it's going to be, so we know the level of employment, for instance, it's going to create, uh, whether it's going to create regeneration uh, in a local area or not. So what we tend to find is that the, the bulk of the green energy design issues are around the environmental aspects. So we're looking at transport, energy, water waste, construction materials, ecology, uh, and emissions. Okay, why be sustainable? I think Hagley's um, given us some uh, good indications about uh, cost and cost benefits. We tend to find a lot of clients are interested in the branding and their, and their image uh, externally. Uh, we um, were involved with the World Trade Center in Dubai and the client there was adamant that they wanted a lead gold minimum for the offices because their view was it enhanced their brand and that they wouldn't get the kind of corporate lets that they wanted to have in those circumstances. Uh, we're involved in another project where the client is trying to develop a new airport and make it carbon neutral. Uh, that's really around brand and about planning and getting through the planning process. So there are branding issues, there's financial benefits that we discussed earlier. There are certainly corporate issues. Um, back in the UK, the government will only take Briam excellent buildings uh, when it's looking for new promises to let. There's certainly um, a view, which we'll touch on a little bit later, about how we can future-proof our buildings. Um, and there is certainly a lot of customer demand in different geographical areas around the world. However, if none of those sort of sustainability drivers work for you, what you tend to find nowadays is there's a regulatory minimum floor of issues that you would need to look at. Um, if we take those and uh, look at the key drivers and the constraints, which is the first part of looking at the design development process, um, you tend to find that, I mentioned the regulatory process, you have your own regulations, you've got your uh, G factors, uh, the Energy Performance in Buildings Directive was discussed this morning. Um, that's common across the whole of the, um, the EU. Uh, it sets a, a common calculation process for establishing operational energy in buildings at design stage. It sets targets and, of course, is the energy performance certificate process that you would go through. That was what I would call a minimum, a minimum sustainable energy level. On top of that, clients might have their own view on whether they want a LEED or a BRIAM rated building. Um, there is quite a lot of evidence now that that will add value in terms of rental yields and in terms of the capital cost, sorry, the capital value of developments when they're finished. We get other um, slightly more odd uh, uh, client requirements. Um, zero carbon comes up quite a lot. Um, sometimes it's um, clients want an iconic green building. Uh, sometimes they're trying to create local employment. There's a variety of other sustainability issues uh, from, from the client that might come along. And likewise, we're also trying to look forward in terms of what legislation might come, might come up next. Um, there are now, Europe has signed up to 20% uh, renewable energy generation by 2020. Um, that has been divvied up to different countries around the EU. Uh, the UK has got 15% um, uh, contribution to make. Um, other countries slightly further north in Europe have a high ability to provide renewable energy because of the natural infrastructure that they have. So there's different requirements across Europe. Um, the, uh, some of you may well know that the Kyoto uh, Protocol is being renegotiated at the moment. It runs out in 2012. Um, it's inevitable when the negotiations are complete that new CO2 and greenhouse gas targets will be agreed by Europe and they will then be divvied up uh, accordingly to the, and each nation state will have their own target uh, that they have to reach. And that invariably has a knock-on and tightens up regulation. 
Looking forwards as well, you'll be wanting to try and understand the effect of climate change. Uh, we've done a project recently where we were trying to cast forward the energy requirements for projects until 2030. Every site's got some kind of constraint on it in terms of um, whether it's uh, low on water or there's no gas, whatever it might be. Geographical location uh, will have an effect. Obviously, the design of a green building uh, uh, in Dubai will be quite different than the design of a green building in Sweden. Geographical location, uh, the building function. Um, if you've got intermi intermittently heated buildings, then what you're usually trying to do is to increase the envelope insulation to keep that heat in. If you've got buildings like um, a data centre, where you've got a permanent heat gain, what you're usually looking to do is to uh, reduce the insulation in the fabric to let the heat out and reduce the amount of cooling that you have to, have to provide. I mentioned briefly before utilities. Obviously, if you have no uh, utilities on your site, then you're going to have to generate energy uh, on the site itself. You need to look at local materials, uh, potential for renewable energy, and, of course, skill sets within the area, and whether you're trying to reinforce or create new skill sets as part of the construction process. I don't know if this slide is projected particularly well. It's an indication um, of a site that we uh, are working on at the moment. The red lump um, is the footprint. Um, we're showing the, the sun path, because that obviously influences the design. We have a large elevation that's west-facing, so we've got some overheating problems. You can see the road running through the site, so there's some issues around uh, noise and vibration being transmitted into the building. We have a river um, just at the bottom there, where we're looking at using for, for cooling, uh, cooling facilities for the building. We've got some shading on the north. It's really just a, um, a quick graphical overview of the assets that are available uh, on that particular site, and that would vary on, on every site uh, that we come across. So having looked at the um, drivers and, and the constraints on a particular site, and you've pulled all those together and got a feel for it, and what we then would look to do is to organise a stakeholder workshop. Uh, and in the workshop, we're trying to pull together the broadest possible audience of people that were involved in the particular project. So there's going to be the architect there, the engineers, um, the client. Uh, there may be representatives of local uh, users. There might be people on adjacent sites. Um, there might well be in, uh, might involve the local utility people. We tend to find at these meetings is everybody's got something to say about sustainability. Either um, we want a green roof, or we'd like to um, have rainwater harvesting, or um, energy is very expensive, so we want to reduce the amount of energy. You tend to find when you start to get the ball rolling, all of, everybody starts to chip in, and it's a bit hectic trying to manage it all. So to, to, to do all of that, we have a bit of a structure. We review the drivers and the constraints so we have a bit of a starting point. There's no point uh, considering for instance, solar thermal uh, in the middle of Sweden, for instance. It's not really going to work particularly well for you. So you can start to frame the agenda and then we would run through the economic, environmental and social issues uh, to, to provide a framework to tease out and, and try and control the, the enthusiasm that there seems to be for um, sustainability. Having done that, we get on to the developing the options. Now, a lot of the issues that we'll just very, very briefly touch on have been discussed in some detail this morning. So you'll be looking at um, orientation, lighting, ventilation systems. Um, only one slide on energy. This is an energy hierarchy. The way that we apply this, we work from the bottom up. And in terms of value, by far and away the best value, um, in fact, if you apply it correctly, you'll save a lot of money, is through reducing the energy demand in the first place. So that's squeezing down your lighting loads. Uh, looking at your people loads, increasing your insulation levels, passive orientation, those sorts of things that we discussed this morning, uh, and then looking at energy use efficiently. And then as you move up the hierarchy and you start to look at renewable technologies and low or zero carbon technologies, the, the bangs for your book, if you like, the amount of carbon that you're going to save for the cost starts to go up disproportionately. Likewise, waste hierarchy, just the same. If you can prevent and minimise your waste at the bottom of the hierarchy, very good value as you start to go up and you um, start to look at disposing the top of the hierarchy, disposing of your waste, and it starts to cost you a lot more money. It's easier to minimise that in the first place. And unsurprisingly, likewise with water, you reduce your demand, you control the amount of flow, you use water efficiently uh, before you start to look at uh, recycling water, grey water systems or rainwater harvesting because demand reduction always, always pays. And to just try and demonstrate some of the synergies between energy, water, and waste. This little green bubble there is a, is a site. Uh, it's an, if you look at the energy balance on that site, 
you've got a number of buildings, it might be possible after you've squashed down the loads to share heating, heat rejection from the offices with a heating demand in the residential. You may have some indigenous um, renewable energy supplies. If you don't, if that's not going to satisfy your overall demand, you may need to bring in some uh, supplies from the local grid. Or if you're very fortunate, you might have actually have an output of spare power that you can push out. Now, I appreciate that exporting to the grid um, is different to different parts of the world, and you need a regulatory framework that's going to facilitate that. So we um, need to be a little bit careful with that one. Um, I'll come back to the issue about biogas uh, in a moment. If that's the energy balance, if we then look at the water issues, um, we obviously have consumption on site in uh, whether it's for showers or toilets or whatever it may be. Waste on consumption, we'd be using um, converting the imports like food and uh, paper and packaging from, from a, a nice product when it came in to a waste product going out. So consumption on site can, if you like, get packaged up into these three categories. You'll have uh, um, biodigestible waste, food waste. You'll have um, green waste from, from your garden, from trees and the like. You'll have human waste that can go into a living machine, which is essentially a, a local treatment plant. And then what's left uh, in a solid waste can go into a gasification type plant. And both the uh, biodigestible waste and the uh, solid waste can get converted, gasified and converted, and it feeds back into the energy balance. The living machine obviously produces a black, a black water that we can use again. The residual of that is some, some solid waste. And very quickly, looking at water this time, you've obviously got grey water use and uh, fresh water users on site, rainwater. The living machine can provide the black water. Um, in other parts of the world, the black water is used to irrigate, uh, irrigate and provide a, a green environment around the buildings, particularly as you go further south. Uh, and of course, the consequences of surplus water is rainwater runoff or foul to the sewer. Now, if you look at those three topics, they all overlap. And what we were trying to do in terms of designing and developing our building is to try and maximise that overlap so that we reduce the overall carbon footprint. And that's on top of reducing the demand in the first place. Just quickly running through the rest of the topics. Um, construction resources, you're looking at, as been mentioned, sourcing of green materials, green travel plans, you're reducing the carbon footprint of people coming, going back and forth to the site, you're trying to control emissions. Uh, site welfare, health and safety on site, they all fall within the sustainability agenda. Um, the topic that always seems to cause the most consternation is transport. People seem to always want to use their car. There is a lot of push now to get people out of cars, uh, using public transport, whether it's trams or buses or cycling. You've obviously got to facilitate that with your, uh, with your building. You need to have showers for people when they cycle in so they can get changed and get cleaned. Uh, provide good public transport information and timetabling. Um, but it's quite a tricky one to crack, uh, is transport. And finally, there's a whole variety of, of environment and ecological issues that we would need to consider. Uh, flood risk, seismic risk, uh, construction noise, uh, wind studies, air quality, air quality frequently city centres prevent you from using uh, natural ventilation. And invariably, particularly on brownfield sites, you can actually enhance the ecological footprint. So if you look at all of those issues, those are the issues that you're, you're optioneering um, through the development process. There's quite a lot to try and collect there, and there are a number of checklists that can, can help with that. LEED and BRIAM provide that indirectly. There are development-wide checklists uh, that are available on the internet. Um, there's also, if you happen to be using retail, there's a number of very good retail checklists. Um, uh, Marks and Spencers, uh, who are a large retailer in the UK, have got a 100-point checklist. And it provides a very good starting point just to flick through and try and understand what all the issues are. Um, once you've looked at all of those options and been through a process of evaluating which are the most appropriate ones for your site, uh, you need to then uh, go back to your, perhaps a cut down version of your stakeholder meeting uh, people, so you've got your client there and key stakeholders. You will have been reporting progress when you've been looking at all of those options as you've uh, been developing them. Um, ideally, there's no surprises you'll have a draft sustainability strategy that pulls together all of those topics into one document. Um, you can take, if you've got LEED or BRIAM, you can do the pre-assessments to show what kind of a score you're going to get. You take it back to the meeting. Hopefully the meeting, uh, as I say, there'll be no surprises, so it should be just a matter of getting it signed off. 
Where there are residual options, you'll need to do a proper evaluation of that, including cost and impact, so that you can take that decision, uh, take those opportunities back to the client and discuss those with them and, and get them closed out. At the end of that process, you should have a sustainability strategy uh, for, the, for your development that provides the value that, that Hadley previously spoke about. Um, last slide, just to, to highlight the whole of that process that, we, that we've touched upon, understanding the key drivers, the constraints, looking at all of those options, all occurs up here in the first two stages on this particular diagram. I'm sure different diagrams have different stages around uh, project recognition uh, and planning. Once the sustainability strategy has been signed off here, um, my role as a sustainability consultant really starts to sit outside of the process and we are really compliance monitoring and making sure that what we've committed to in the sustainability strategy through the design development, through detailed design and through construction uh, is actually delivered. So we can sign it off when the building's operational uh, and we've achieved what we said we would set out to achieve in the first place. And just to close the circle, obviously there is then an operational period for the building and ultimately 50, 60, 70 years in here, a demolition process and, and back we go around again. That's the end. Thank you.